talking. This entire interview was just a ploy to get vinyls, clearly. That was just what I was trying to do. <laughs> About 15 years ago, I discovered Diablo Swing Orchestra, an avant-garde metal band from Sweden that combines elements of opera, swing, electronic music, tango, and a lot of things that, honestly, if I describe them to you, sound like they couldn't possibly work. But they do, and they do in a very good way, not in a funny or novelty way. They are extremely talented musicians, and they keep producing this really, really, really good music. Now, I'm not just saying these positive things about them because, you know, it's kind of polite to say something positive about the people that you're interviewing. No, on the contrary, I have been a fan of this band for a long time, and that is why I decided to reach out to them once I found out that they were going to release a new album at the end of this year and see if we could talk about it. But what I got was much more than that. I had the opportunity to talk for a long time with Daniel Hackinson. He is the guitarist and founder of the band, and he has shaped a lot of the musical and lyrical development for... Uh, well, the entire history of the Diablo Swing Orchestra. It was a really interesting interview because we didn't just discuss their upcoming album, but instead we also reviewed how Daniel, from the very beginning, started to develop this interest in music that, for the rest of us, might seem a little bit disconnected from each other. It is not that there's anything wrong in liking swing or liking opera or liking tango or liking heavy metal, but it is not often that you find that somebody can not only like them all separately, but combine them and create something new. And that is exactly what Diablo Swing Orchestra have done for about 15 years, which I like so, so much, which is why I'm so happy to have the opportunity to bring this interview to you today. But before we go into the interview, there are a couple of things that I wanna ask you. First, like this video and subscribe to our channel. It really helps us being found, so even if you cannot do anything else for us, just liking the video, commenting below, and subscribing can really help us. Second, if you're in a position where donating is possible for you, we would really appreciate it if you could support us. We have a donation page on our website, and any help goes straight into the website. We don't have ads, we don't run sponsored posts, so your help will be really useful. But enough of that for now. Go on and enjoy this interview that I did with Mr. Daniel Hackinson, guitarist and founder of Diablo Swing Orchestra. Until next time, stay metal. Diablo Swing Orchestra are an avant-garde heavy metal band from Sweden, which is to say they mix a lot of stuff, including jazz, metal, opera, swing, and even some dubstep to create something truly amazing. Some people have described it as if Danny Elfman collaborated with System of a Down and got Maria Callas behind the microphone, if I am not mistaken. Uh, <laughs> formed in 2003, DSO have released four studio albums, the vinyls of which I can never find, and this year they're planning to release a fifth one, Swagger and Stroll Down the Rabbit Hole. Daniel Hackinson is a guitarist and one of the founders of DSO, and he joins me today from his home in Sweden. Daniel, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, my pleasure. How was 2020 for you, and more broadly, the, your experience, both professional as well as personal, with, with the pandemic and everything that was uh, happening? Obviously, the music industry in particular has been very affected, so I, I'm wondering how you guys dealt with it. Yeah, well, I guess we dealt with it with, with uh, we were taking our time with the album. So that was basically what we were doing. We, we re started recording in uh, May and then went on all through the summer and then worked on the mixes all another year. But it, it took us a year in total. So most of 2020 was uh, we were in the studio or we were in pre-production. So I think, I guess a lot of bands did the same thing because was not much else to do <laughs> besides sitting in the studio and also the regulations in Sweden were a bit softer than most of the world I think so we were able to travel to the studio and stuff and sitting in, in there instead so yeah that was basically what we do. I was speaking just uh, I think a couple of days ago with one of the members of Fear Factory for example and he was mentioning how yes it was a very stressful time but at the same time it allowed me to just take my time with my music, take my time with my record. Did you, in a way, feel that there was less pressure for you guys to complete the album, which is what allowed you to take an entire year? Or would it have taken that long regardless of what happened? <laughs> well, the thing with, with us and recording, at least with the latest two, something always seems to come up when we don't expect it. But uh, this, this time around, I would say we took our time because we knew that we were, we were not be able to tour anyway, so there was no rush in getting it done. And uh, our, so to say, ninth member, uh, Roberto Laghi, who's the producer of our latest four albums, 
also finally got the time to sit and really work with the mixes in a, with a, a little bit more calm involved, not so much stress if it, towards a deadline that it has to be done by. Of course, it has to be done some, sometimes, but uh, I think he was quite pleased with the way he was able to work with it. I mean, some, some days he worked for two hours, other days he worked for 10 hours, but he, he could take his time as well with the mix because that's a problem we've had with all albums, because uh, there's so much things going on at the same time, and we don't really have a blueprint somewhere else to say, okay, this is the band we want to sound like, because the, we, we think that the trumpet is just as important as the guitar, so it's not a background thing in our band. So this time he really found the sweet spot for every instrument, and we're really happy with how it turn, turned out. Before we actually get into this, particular album which is the one that we sh we, we should see i think in november if i am not mistaken it should be around the release yep. date it's a the the digital release is on the 2nd of uh, november and the first single will be out on august 13th and then there will be two more singles in in, in september and october before the release but, so before we get into the the album itself i want to take you a little bit back because I am curious since you and Pontus in particular are the the, the driving force behind the band in, as far as songwriting goes, uh, I am curious as to what were your origins as a musician? How did you get into, you in particular at least, how did you start with music and was it always as eclectic as it sounds in the case of DSO? Because you wouldn't listen to it and think, oh, this guy grew up listening to Iron Maiden, because it's like, oh, this guy grew up listening to Iron Maiden, but also a lot of swing. Yeah, so... <laughs> yeah well, the, the thing is that for me, I, I haven't listened to that much. I, I know the conception is that we listen to really strange music and, and that, that we perhaps have more eclectic tastes than we actually do. Uh, my, my background that I always sort of blame why I, I, I write the kind of music that I do is because of my mother. Uh, she was an aspiring opera singer and she had this habit of making us these mixtapes with all kinds of different music. I, I, I always tell the story when she used to wake us up on Sunday mornings with a bagpipe uh, concert. That was her idea of... An, kind of illustrating, okay, this is really cool music. It was something more coming from the African continent with all these tribal beats and stuff, or it was Swedish folk music. It was everything thrown into once, and they would play it back to back. So for me, our kind of music is how I grew up, basically. Everything in there, maybe not in the same song back then, but for me, it's, it's, it's not so strange that it may sound at the first listen. I mean, I, I fully understand that, but I, I would say that it's still eclectic in the sense that most people who listen to heavy metal, for example, or who yes, grow yes. up shaped by heavy metal, yeah. do not also have a, a, a passion for a big horn section uh, in, 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 an or, in a swing orchestra. Of course, I, I, it just so happens that one of the things that attract me to DSO is the fact that I, I like that type of music. I, I don't dance it because it would be hilarious if I did, but I do like swing music. I think it's kind of fun. I yeah. like ska, so I kind of understand the pleasure of having trombones or trumpets and stuff like yeah. that in the music, so I get it. But it is not normal or average that somebody likes Iron Maiden and also likes swing. Uh, or in, in the sense that they yeah, come yeah. from such different areas. And it is so wonderful, I think, that you managed to combine them in a way that created this. Because when I started listening to DSO, for example, back in 2006, so around the time Butcher's Ball Ballroom came out, All right. there wasn't really anything else that sounded like uh, Diablo Swing Orchestra. No, I mean, for, for us, I mean, the, the first album was a lot of trial and error. So, I mean, we, we had no record company. We had no real, uh, I should say, agenda about what we wanted to do. We, we were just sure we wanted to record an album, and that, that was it. That was our goal with it. And, and uh, we had these songs, and we worked on it a lot, me and Pontus, uh, back then, because we met in 2003. So we, we did some, some demo recordings back and forth. Uh, and we had no clue that the, the whole, what should I say, female-fronted genre, or, or at least how you describe it as a genre, uh, existed. We had no clue. So we thought that this was more of a really new thing, because the whole idea with the opera thing, of course, came from, from my, my mother. And um, 
and also the the song microcuts from muse that was a huge revelation for me when i heard it and i said oh you can combine it with opera and doesn't sound like cheese basically and uh, so that was kind of the, what what really got me going with these this overly dramatic music combined with with rock music i had no clue either theory and nightwish or all of those bands existed at all i know we got a lot of comparison especially with the first album to them and then of course i, I listened to them and said oh okay this was not so <laughs> not not it wasn't so unique that i thought and then we kind of steered even further into other territory with the second album and fourth so to say it's interesting though because although you, you're right i mean there were comparisons with nightwish at the time and theory as well but i think that it mostly came from the fact that people were noticing the fact that there was an opera singer and then yeah. because yeah. nightwish created so many clones right there were mm -hmm. so many bands that were just cookie cutter copies of nightwish but of course, what made you different is that you were not creating symphonic or, or powered metal behind the opera. Instead, you were mixing it with this yeah, swing. Uh, I, I'm quite interested in that because, you know, you said you didn't have a record label. You just had these songs. But so take me a little bit back to the beginning of DSO. Was it just you and Pontus and then trying to find musicians or through... An, an incredibly unlikely series of events. You actually got seven people who were totally into swing and, <laughs> and, and electric guitars and opera. Yeah, well, the thing was that me, I met uh, Pontus back then, in two, I think it was even in 2002. And uh, uh, then we, we, we just hit it off straight away with, with playing. Uh, we were studying at the same town uh, at the time. And uh, we just sat outside and played with two um, uh, acoustic guitars. And he also showed me how he could play the didgeridoo. And he was also really, really good with, with recordings. He, it, was, it was his big interest, so to say, with recording and all of this, this kind of more electronic music was his forte, or still is his forte, so to say. So he, uh, and uh, we got really good friends, and then we started writing our first uh, demo, which we recorded back then in 2003 as well. And uh, I, I, he knew Johannes from before, and uh, I knew Anders, uh, the bass player from before. Uh, so so, and also the drummer we at the time, uh, Andreas. Uh, I had played with uh, earlier. So we kind of called old friends, so to say, and say, okay, hey, we have this demo we're going to record. We want to come and try it out. And I guess it grew from there. I mean, both uh, the, our trumpeter and, 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 and trombone player knew Johanna. So it's, it's, it's been very lucky coincidences, I must say, that we found each other and that we could unite within this musical frame and, and start creating together because from the beginning of the first album, I wrote pretty much not all by myself, but the songs were basically with mostly me and then Pontus arranging and also creating all these uh, electronic twists on top. Uh, and then it became more and more of a joint venture, so to say, in, in, in collaboration, how we, how we approached the music and we started writing together. And today, uh, with uh, Christine on the fourth and even on the fifth album now, she's a really heavy force behind the, the, the songwriting as well. So it, the whole band is contributing a lot more now. So that's been a, a journey for us. Now, at the beginning, when DSO releases The Butcher's Ballroom, there was something else connected to it. It wasn't just the music. There was a whole mythology of DSO <laughs> behind it, right? Like yeah. a band from the 1500s, anti-clericalism. Uh, tell yeah. me a little bit, of, even if that doesn't exist anymore, tell me a little bit of where that came from. The, well, b basically out of, it's the same thing, I guess, that we approach the music. Uh, stuff that's already been done is boring. That's a really general way of thinking in DSO in general, because to have a, a normal bi biography saying that we met here and there, blah, blah, blah. I, it's just because we, we, we didn't want to do it that way because that was boring. And I mean, I th find it sometimes boring to, to read. There, there are thousands of them, basically. Friends meeting up and they started playing and so on. So it was basically just to do something else because I couldn't pull myself together to actually write a proper biography. I just wrote that instead. So there was no interest afterwards in continuing that I think that at least for us as a band, a lot of things just happen. We never had a clear goal where to set this as a career. We wanted to have fun, and that was basically it. And that was fun to write and to just laugh about a little bit. And uh, 
I, I guess that was it. We, we never thought anyone would believe it, naturally, because it's such an obvious lie. Of course, I mean, it is. <laughs> yeah. that, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that point, though, because I, I think it, many, many artists get asked, did you ever think that it would get this big? But I think that the right question is, what did you think was going to happen with that first album? Did you only think, I mean, a couple of people will hear it, or did you actually hope sincerely that it was actually going to pick up? Was it a surprise for you that it did? The, the thing is that for, for, for me, it's, it's, it's two things with it. I, I really enjoy marketing uh, uh, as such. I actually did a lot of marketing of the album, but that was after it was done just because that's, well, it's been my education as well. So I did a lot of marketing because I thought it was fun and I tried it out and it worked. But of course, I could never believe it would grow this big naturally. I, it was more, it's, it's a hobby something that you know pass time with and I, I thought that was just as much fun because it's since we live scattered around sweden we, we, we can't and still can't rehearse that much so I, I i never thought we would take this really on the road it was more of a project thing it's mindset so to say because um the 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 way i thought not that many as you said the, the combination between stars i thought okay maybe i've Maybe a few people will like this, and that was basically it. But then I just tried it out. I started mailing out, and then when we got the feedback, I said, "Oh, that's weird. People seem to really catch on." As you say, metalheads and non-metalheads could kind of unite in. Okay, this is nice from both per perspectives. You got the heavy guitars, and you got the the other danceable parts, or or a little bit a, a twist to it. You haven't heard this before, so it, it kind of caught on from there. And then I mean, we just kept on writing music and and, and playing and. Well, still do, 17 or 18 years later. Where have you been able to, I mean, I don't mean country by country, by overall, where have you been able to tour with uh, DSO? I think that you did Mexico, uh, the United States and Mexico, didn't you as well? Yeah, yeah, we, we played there. I mean, we, we played, uh, I mean, the, by far the biggest concerts we do would, would be in Mexico and uh, in South America. And then uh, uh, Russia would be the, the we would play most times. And then, but we played uh, Germany, we played Netherlands, we played, uh, uh, let's see, Italy, we played Czech Republic. I mean, a little bit over Europe, and, but I mean, we have, I, I don't think we even have played 50 concerts in, in total. I'm very interested because it's, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that your, your biggest shows tend to be in, in Latin America, because one of the things that surprises me about some bands is that for no apparent reason they do very well in latin america i've noticed that with halloween recently for example i we, we did an interview with them by far mm -hmm. the most visitors come from latin america uh, and in the case of dso i've also noticed a lot of when you post something the comments tend to come from a lot of people from latin america were you surprised that your music resonated in that it, i mean it's not that there's anything of course racial or cultural that prevents them from enjoying the music it's just fascinating in the same way as when an artist happens to be big in Japan. In, in a way, I think that the, the starting point from for the love affair with Mexico was that for for some reason back in the day with, when MySpace was a thing, I think that the promoters, uh, uh, well, the promoters we still have in, in in Mexico, found our MySpace and they try and we were booked for a gig in uh, in Atlanta at uh, the uh, Pro Power Festival. So they wanted to kind of try us out. So we, we, we got a, a, a support slot for, for Children of Bodom. So we played as an opening act for them and Amorphis in 2009. And I know that that concert was kind of a turning point because it was filled already with, with, with people. And a lot of people from that concert kind of caught on with us, us from that point. And we came back, I think, in 2012 we were one, one one time in between 2009 and then in 2012 and then the place was sold out the same place we played with the uh, children of bottom so it, it got really big from there and that was kind of the starting point where we also could go down and play in in, in latin america in brazil and colombia argentina as well we we're supposed to play in venezuela but <laughs> we didn't get through customs there so you got to the country of venezuela and you couldn't enter the country yeah <laughs> Can you tell me that story? Yeah, it, it was. Uh, uh, I, I guess I we blame it on, on not the proper papers were were given to us in order to enter. Uh, let's put it in that. So the thing was that we got to Venezuela. It was the the first uh, gig 
in Caracas, we were supposed to play on the on the tour. So we, we flew over and got there. And for some reason, we were the late the, the last people in the line to we were supposed to enter. And all of a sudden they started yelling because we, there were different lines and they started yelling, hey, 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 something. Since I, I personally don't speak Spanish, I don't know what they said. But for some reason they caught on that we were a band. And uh, we were not supposed to enter as a band. I don't know why. We I, I, we show them the paper we had, and they say, no, 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 okay, you sit here. So we sat down and uh, waited and waited. So we actually spent the night uh, at the airport and found out through a janitor and also people working at, at the airport helping us uh, to be able to continue the tour and to get deported to Colombia instead of getting deport, deported back to, to Sweden. And the funny thing was that since the return ticket was not supposed to be used, they had booked us the return ticket to Rome. So if we would have come back, they would have sent us back to Rome instead. Jeez. And then we and then we would have missed the whole tour. So they were, well, I, I don't know, I don't remember the names, but we're really grateful for so the, the people working at the airport in, in Caracas for helping us out. So we actually had some stamps in our passport saying deported, uh, and then we got deported to Colombia instead. We could could continue the tour. It's a fun story today, but I, I I think that that was the most well, at least one of the most nervous nights we've had ever. And I, I think I was on the phone for <laughs> a lot of a lot of hours because it showed up on my phone bill when I got home. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, uh, you and Pontus tend to be front and center writing music and lyrics. Tell me a little bit about the process of that goes into making a, a DSO song. Is it something that you are able to do together? Or as you mentioned that you're scattered throughout Sweden, it ends up being more of a, I did this thing, what do you think? What can you add? How does it function? Well, the uh, the thing with with uh, with the songwriting is, I, I think it's not one process. It's one process per album, I would say. As I stated earlier, the the, the first album was I wrote basically everything, including cello lines and, and all of it. And the second one, the collaboration with me and Pontus was more intertwined. So we wrote a lot together and also recorded demos, just him and me, uh, with, with uh, program drums and stuff like that. And that went even further on the third album. But then also uh, Johannes stepped in a lot more and put a lot of time into the arrangements for or, or orchestral stuff. Uh, and on the... And then, of course, with the big change with, with uh, Christine coming into the, the, the band, the writing for the fourth album was she came up with the three or four basic ideas for songs for that album. And then I had less time in terms of production for that one. So the whole, the whole collaboration part was even stronger for that album. And for this one, it's been mostly me and Christine writing songs. And then, and also, Martin, the uh, trumpet guy, play, wrote his song of his own as well, and also singing on one of the albums. So it's, it's not one process; it's, it's different for each album, depending on how we live and our well family situation and stuff like that. How much time you can put into the the, the project, so to say. Since you mentioned that for the first album, you even wrote the cello lines. Of what do you? What I, I know that you're the guitarist in the band officially, but what other instruments do you play and, and write for normally? Well. I only play, I mean, it, it depends on I mean, if, if I actually should say I would play something, it's only guitar that I actually play. <laughs> so I could stand for that statement. But but of course, I mean, I, I fumble around a little bit on piano and bass, uh, stuff like that. But I, I wouldn't say I'm actually a bass or a piano player at all. Uh, but of course, I mean, you, if you have a sense of melody, uh, you, you, can, you can normally come up with some basic ideas. And of course, then uh people being able to play the, the instrument much better takes it and then rearrange it or makes it fit for their, their respect, respective uh, instrument so to say so I, I could write for any instrument but of course it's not the the end result i'm writing today it's more that like I, I come up with ideas for the other instruments or arrangements and mostly martin and, and johannes uh, they kind of share the, the arrangement duties today uh, on both the last album and this one. You know, you, you mentioned now the, the writing of Swagger and Stroll down the rabbit hole, and earlier you mentioned how this continues to be something that you do for fun, uh, in the sense that it is not your main source of income, and that it is yeah. something that you are able to feel a little bit independent from. Um, 
what does that mean in practice in the sense that does it mean that when it comes to writing music you go listen i know that this is what i want to hear i don't care whether people like it or not or do you still try to maintain a certain consistency so that there is a certain brand of dso and a certain sound of dso that you want to have clearly associated to you well uh... It can, yes and no, because I think that the, the, with, with us in the band and, and our music taste put together, it will be a certain kind of music, even though the, the, the musical frame of the band is really, really wide, because we put in a lot of different genres or, or ways of playing and stuff like that. So, uh, of course, if, if I was or we were dependent on this band, I don't think we. I don't think we would have even would have started with the whole idea. It, it's not. I mean, if you pitch it towards a label, I think it for them to know that this was would will catch on as, and make it as big as as it, as it has been or is. Uh, it's, it's a big risk, so to say, because with the, the, all the people we we employ during recordings and and the, the length of recording sessions, it's a it's a very expensive hobby, and of course we get we get fun. I mean, we get well, how should I say, we get a, a good amount of money from the record label, of course, today. But if this was our main source of income, I don't think that we would dare to do it the way we do it with each album, because I, sometimes we know that this will not resonate with the people who like the last album. And, and, and we, we don't really care. I, I wouldn't say we don't care about it, because of course you want people to enjoy it, but that's not why we do it, because I think that you could help people uh, broaden their horizon in terms of what they want to listen to. Uh, I know that we get a lot of, of emails saying that, okay, you helped me start listening to metal or you started, you, or a metalhead started listening to swing instead of stuff. So, I mean, that, that's a really fun side effect of the music we do, that you introduce genres to people that maybe wouldn't have found them otherwise. It's interesting that you mentioned this thing that, if this was your main source of income, perhaps you would have never started because of the risk that it represents. Because I'm thinking about uh, an interview that I was recently reading with, not exactly a fan, but uh, uh, Gene Simmons, the singer and uh, bassist yeah. of Kiss, because he was talking often about how uh, the current music market has prevented the appearance of big music acts because there isn't that much money to, to go around, let's say. Uh, but what's interesting about that is that at the same time, I think, the it is precisely the internet that has allowed bands like yours to kind of become popular, to kind of become known, because there isn't necessarily that risk of pressing the music at the beginning, and that, that allows for the for the spread of much faster. I discovered you on the internet back then. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, mean have... I would say 99% of, of people have found us uh, through the internet so in, in some way, because... I mean, we, we did, I think it was three or four gigs in Sweden. I mean, we played in total maybe five gigs in Sweden since we started. And, and uh, I mean, we played for 30 people and half of them were not even listening to us when we played. So it's, uh, they, they, we would never be able to get anywhere without the internet. So for, for us, we're just thankful for, for the opportunity it presents. But I, I get his point though, mm -hmm. that, that of course, it's really hard to discuss. It's not just one answer to it, but because of course we could. I mean, if if it would have gotten as big as it is today, we could, in general, started touring uh, maybe back in 2012 for this, and then also generate some income and start living of it. But but the thing is that when 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 you write music like this and it's supposed to be fun all the time, of course, if we this would be everyday work for us. The fun, I, at least for me, I, I, I shouldn't speak for all of the other guys and girls, but, but for me, it would draw the fun out of it if I had to do it all the time. And that, I, I think that would show in the music as well, right? That's what I think, but I mean, it's a guess from, from my end. Tell me a little bit about Swagger and Stroll down the rabbit hole. Yeah, I, <laughs> where to start? I mean, we're extremely proud of it. I mean, I, I, I haven't worked this hard on, on any of the other, but even if I would combine the other albums, it would not even match up to this. Maybe it would closer to the first album because that was a really drawn out process. But the, the, the pre-productions started one and a half year earlier. I traveled back and forth in Sweden, tried to sort things out with, with different members of the band. 
and it was a lot of organization around it and it was a lot of fun recording it so i think that will show in the end that it's it's a band with a lot of confidence in what we're doing because we've done this for quite a long time now and it's finally some issues we've always had when recording has resolved this time around uh as I, one we all already spoke about with with, with, with time with, with the mix especially uh it's a really long album for us with it's 13 full songs there are no interludes at all uh we have um a lot of it's, it's kind of that, that we took the idea so that the the framework that we had from before and then we did it full on this time in a sense because if we wanted to go with a certain genre we really dug down and really tried to understand okay what makes this genre or this kind of of sound uh, sound the way it does if you take like a uh, let's say swing music for for instance since we naturally always have one of those I, I won't spoil the fun of it but but this time it will not sound like it's the swing has sounded in the other albums i can say that much we went another way which for us was really fun because we did something else because everything that becomes formulatic for, well, we say it like a formula when you write music for us that's boring and we want to do something else on each record. And this time we had the time and we had the, the, the idea to go full on in another direction, which was really, and we've done that with a lot of songs. Earlier, you mentioned that connected again with this issue of, of, of income, that you would have that concern of, hey, maybe this is something that older fans, people from the previous album wouldn't like, but that you are mm -hmm. able to kind of be more relaxed about it because it is not this job thing. Mm -hmm. uh, is that the case also in this album, in the sense that there are certain elements or certain aspects of the music that you think, yeah, maybe if you like the previous one, maybe this isn't exactly what you will like? Yeah, I, I would say there are some songs on here that 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 uh, I think that, especially if you take maybe the first album or second album, I would say that it's... <sighs> maybe even further away in a sense from those sound wise but if you look at the 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 structure in terms of harmony and, and the melodies i would still say that it, you could definitely see that that there's a, a, a how do you say it a, a consistency between the albums and i i almost in and when i explain or talk about the the progression of, of our music I, I kind of divide it in two that the first two albums or yeah, but I would say the first two albums has one way of, of thinking of writing, and the last three albums now, with with this latest one uh, included, has has a different approach because I know that with after the second album, uh, I thought that the whole opera thing with with the music was kind of worn out into at least for me in terms of ideas. So the the way Anne Louise was singing on the third album was much less in an operatic way. She kind of broadened her sense, which for, for us then is a, a, a more natural transgression to the next album and when, when Christine joined. So yes, I would say that some some of these songs would be I wouldn't say a turn off perhaps, but at least a bit of a surprise that oh they're doing this now, and then we'll see how people take it. We don't know yet, but. We'll, it will be fun to read their comments and, and <laughs> what do you think is the what do you think is the most divisive thing you've done since you mentioned you know the comments i've seen you even in some facebook groups that i belong to so i assume that you see what people tend to say what do you think has been a divisive musical creation for you? i mean divisive in terms of fans not really liking it as much as the rest of the stuff was it the the dubstep in uh, what was it Pandora's yeah. uh, pacifistic of <laughs> one of those yeah, it's uh, well. I think it's, uh, I, I don't think that it's one thing. Of course, when we changed singer, I would say that that was. I, I th we thought it would be a much bigger issue for a lot of people than it that it actually turned out to be. But uh, I would say that the 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 more the more kind of pop punk, or I, I don't know how to describe the difference in, in terms, but I mean, at least we, we took the opera out. But for, as I said, for us, we already had took the, the, a large chunk of the opera out with the third album. We had two songs that we went full on with, especially we, we did an aria in the, in the third album, Aurora, uh, which we actually, okay, let's do this classical thing full on now and let's see where that takes us. 
So, and also we had, um, oh, I can't remember the name now, but we have another one that was also pure opera singing, but that was basically it for that album. So uh, I think that a lot of fans would, would say that, oh, it was much better when it was opera included, but then there was just as many or maybe more even saying, okay, I, I really like the band, but I can't stand the opera. So it, it wasn't a commercial choice for us. It was more that we were, as I said, we were kind of restless in terms of what we want to do. And this made us be able to do more kinds of different kind of genres and music and blend them in. Uh, in a sense, with with Christine joining. Do you care about comments? Precisely because you have that close relation relation to what the fans are saying. Do you do you yeah. still mind if you see that they say something negative? Does it affect you, or you've learned to just ignore it? No, I think that uh, we think. I would say we think differently in the band, but because I've been doing all the promotion since day one for for the band uh, basically i actually i think it's a good i, I that could be an advice for for aspiring musicians or, or bands just starting out that they need to sit down and they need to think about that they have to value a negative comment just as much as a positive one it, it, it's it's easily said easily said and done but if you do that you you manage to actually you you don't care even if it's positive or if it's negative that's not what's driving you is if you look at it from a marketing perspective, the, the negative ones are just as good for the band as the as the positive ones because you need that kind of polarization to get a discussion going anyway. So I think that you, you need to be able to step if you're going to do the marketing or if you're going to be reading the comments, you need to be able to step back and then you, you value it from for what it is. Another really good advice I could give that if you if you tend to care too much about comments, then you should go into a, a, a band's uh, comment section that you really don't understand. I wouldn't say hate, but you don't understand the band uh, or the music. And then you read through the comments, and then you will find comments saying, like, you, you changed my life. This is the best thing since sliced bread or whatever. And then you, you get the sense, okay, well, it's just an opinion. If you think that's complete rubbish and then that's something whole, this another person's whole life, then you understand that why should I care about this? This is uh, this just a comment, it's just an opinion, and a good one, uh, a positive one is just as valuable as a negative one. You just need to take a step back and not focus too much, and not take, of course, not take it personally. But but that was many years I stopped caring about that. You mentioned that type of, of comment of you changed my life and ha have you received that type of comment and have you gotten used to it? Uh, because I, I've seen sometimes the level of love that you sometimes see from fans towards musicians. I, I've been told because I, I don't get that amount of love. I only get the occasional death threats on the Internet. <laughs> um, the That it can sometimes be a little bit, it's humbling. It's, it's beautiful, of course, to know that your yes. work connected so much with somebody but that it can be a little bit overwhelming, not in a bad way, but it's like, oh my God, this person cares so much and in a positive way, but still so much about me, even though they don't know me and they credit me for their life being better or something like that, that it can be a little bit strange. Has that been, how has it been for you? I, I think that it's, it's the same thing. If, if you do that, if you take that step back uh, and I always, take it as a compliment for the music and for the band uh, and what we created. And I, that, of course, makes me proud that people connect with it. But I, I never think that it's me because if, if or, or any other musicians, but because or unless you're, you're someone like Bone or something like that, that you actually do this huge difference in the world in a sense of charity or whatever. But, but uh, if, you, if, you take, if you change someone's life with your music, it's just if you go back, uh, and you to your own childhood or maybe a youth, and then you say, okay, I, I was like this as well with bands. They completely changed the way I was thinking about uh, music and life. And I, I, I kind of say, okay, this is really humbling that I've been able to do the same thing for someone else. But I think it's a really bad thing for musicians if they actually stop thinking that their person is doing that. that I'm changing them. So that, no, it's something I'm able to do. If, if, if you're a carpenter and if you if you make um, a chair or if you you let's say equipment for the hospital you're, you're changing someone else's life in, in another way 
but that's your trade, that's your profession, or you know, so even if though it's a hobby for us, then but still, uh, you, your craft is what matters, not you as a person. I think it's a really good thing if you do the distinction between those two. Who was a band like that for you when you were developing as a musician? When you were a teenager, the posters in the room, the kind of, at least my, yeah. I destroyed my room with posters. I don't know if you did that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the first really big band for me was a Swedish punk band called uh, Strebers, uh, of course not known outside of Sweden, but I was really big on, on, on punk music in general. And then after a while, of course, uh, Nirvana uh, came along and, and, and changed a lot of things. And with this whole, I, I, I be, same with Muse, three-piece <laughs> bands has been really my thing in terms of, and also this really explosive live shows with, with uh, general chaos. And I think that's, that's what I bring into to this band uh, a lot, because I always think that I'm in a three-piece punk band on stage anyway when we play. But of course, I have to uh, adjust a little bit when we record. Because we <laughs> do that with all of these musicians, and and and, and uh, at least three of us are professional musicians as well. They play in orchestras and stuff. So it's 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 a good mixture of of uh, philosophies when it comes to music. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, that everything goes well. Vaccination is widespread, and everything is fine. And tours and festivals, etc., are happening next year. And we don't have to deal with this shit ever again. So let's assume that <laughs> yeah, this yeah, is let's, the let's case. Yeah, I, I would love to. <laughs> so let's just assume that that's the case. Um, mm -hmm. Are you guys planning on doing, a, even if it is a, a small tour? Yes. We are working uh, with, with a booking agency and, and um, we are planning to go to uh, Northern, I think Northern Europe in... Uh, uh, January, and then we have some the southern parts with uh, in uh, April, and then we probably will throw in uh, Mexico and Russia around there somewhere. We haven't figured it all out, but it, it, in in the spring and summer of 2020 we'll be touring. At least that's the plan. Of course, we we know as little as anyone else if it will work or not, but that's the plan at least. Great, that would be my first. Uh... DSO show. Even if you don't come to the Netherlands, I'll find you in Germany or somewhere because I think I owe it to myself to after yeah. like, what is it, 15 yeah, no, years no, 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 to finally be able to come to Amsterdam. That, that's that's the plan at least. So I, I hope so. Uh, and finally, something that interests me exclusively, I think. Are you planning to reissue vinyls of your old uh, records? Because, you know, Butcher's Ballroom, all of that stuff, at least the LP versions are almost impossible to find. Yeah, I I think that we will we, uh, do some talk. This entire interview was just a ploy to get vinyls. Clearly, that was just what I was trying to do. <laughs> just no, forty minutes no, just to course, get to this I, question. There will there will be be uh, at least that there's been been some discussion we have uh, as well as merch in general because we've been really bad in that department before because of <laughs> what we've been doing is that we've been recording and then we've been so exhausted that we haven't even been able for the last three albums to get our act together with, with proper merch and, and including vinyls and reissues. So that's the plan, yes. And also a shop when you can get this stuff and all of that to set, be set up. So let's, uh, we can keep in touch and then I'll let you know when we have some news on there. Excellent, now. final, yeah. final. Yes. I have my credit card ready. Uh, Daniel, thank you so much for having taken the time to speak with me today. I, I'm a yeah. big fan of the band. Uh, I know that we have many fans among our viewers, so I'm very thankful for the opportunity, and I yeah. wish you all the best, man. Take care of yourself. Yeah. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.